Last week, we explored the invention of radio. Though the wireless transmission of sound was certainly a huge technological breakthrough, it was only a small part of a much bigger picture. As we discussed in the previous episode, it was the vacuum tube that made radio possible. The electronic vacuum tube made for more reliable radio, but most importantly, it allowed for the amplification of a signal. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The ability to take a weak electrical signal and amplify it into a much stronger one revolutionized the world of sound. Vacuum tubes made possible electrical sound recording. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. Radio was an improvement in more ways than one. Obviously, the ability to listen to free content being broadcast was a huge advantage, and the variety of programming available to the listener grew day by day. But not only was the content radically different than records of the time, it sounded a lot better. As a reminder, this is what a Victrola sounds like. Not exactly high fidelity, but radio sounded much more real. That's due to a few different things. First, there's the loudspeaker, which is simply much better at reproducing sound. But the biggest thing was the electronic microphone. Instead of a mechanical reproducer attached to a cutting needle, microphones use thin membranes attached to a clever arrangement of magnets. Why is this important? Well, because microphones are much more sensitive. Think back to the old acoustically recorded discs for a moment. Remember how the vibrations in the disc moved this needle, which in turn vibrated the diaphragm to make noise? During recording, the opposite happened. The sound waves from performers' voices or instruments would vibrate this diaphragm and create a wobbly pattern in a blank disc. This worked, sure, but there were problems. This diaphragm is very stiff. It's very tough. It takes a lot of force to move it. That means that when recording, only loud noises can make it move. Not only that, but some noises will make it move better than others. Really high sounds don't move it at all, and low sounds tend to get distorted. The result is a recording with a limited range of sound. Though these early phonographs could certainly hear all the sound in the room, only some of those sounds made it into the recording because of the stiff and heavy diaphragm. The electronic microphone, on the other hand, was quite different. It's constructed much like the loudspeaker, but smaller. Recall that the loudspeaker moved a large diaphragm using an electromagnet and a permanent magnet. If a current was sent through the wire, the electromagnet would repel itself away from the permanent magnet and move the diaphragm. Send quickly fluctuating current through it, and you'll get a vibrating diaphragm that makes noise. But, and this is the key, the opposite is also true. If I move the diaphragm of a loudspeaker, it actually creates a current in the wire. That's because now we're moving a coil of wire around a magnet, and this induces current inside the wire. Loudspeakers and microphones are in essence the same thing. We just change what we're doing with them. Here's a quick way that I can show you. These are clearly headphones. I've got them plugged into the headphone jack of my laptop, and by Jove, they're making noise, just like they're designed to. Take a listen. See? But watch what happens when I unplug them from my laptop's headphone jack and plug them into the microphone jack. You can actually hear my voice through the headphones. Now the vibrations from my voice are causing the diaphragms inside the headphones to vibrate. This causes the coil of wire to move around the magnet and that induces a current inside the wire. That current travels down this cord and into my laptop's microphone jack and the laptop is able to record those signals as sound. Pretty neat, huh? Sound recording is a world of opposites. In every invention we've explored so far, the vibrations from sound are recreated, they're duplicated by some sort of mechanism that captures the pattern of vibrations from a source and duplicates them in either another place or another time. The telephone did it by altering the strength of an electric current traveling through a rudimentary microphone and then sending this fluctuating current through a crude loudspeaker. The phonograph used a physical medium to store sound, impressing the pattern of vibrations into a cylinder or disc which could be used to recreate that sound. Radio captured the vibrations using a newer type of microphone, transforming those vibrations into radio waves and then recreating those vibrations with a loudspeaker. Each of these inventions transformed vibrations into some sort of medium where they could be recreated with certain equipment. The telephone transformed sound directly into an electrical signal. The phonograph used wax to make a physical record, and the radio used electromagnetic radiation to send sound through the air. But the one thing they have in common is their goal, to duplicate the sound being captured, or more specifically, to exactly copy the vibrations being picked up. You might be asking, what does this have to do with anything? It's important, that's what. The electronic microphone could be made with much lighter materials. 
Because the diaphragm was only responsible for moving a small coil of wire, the diaphragm could be much lighter and more flexible. This meant that it responded to sound waves hundreds of times better than these acoustic reproducers could ever hope to. So, ditch the old recording methods, got it. Use the microphones we use in radio to make records. Okay, but how? How on earth are we supposed to take the electrical signal coming from this thing and turn it into a phonograph record? Why we use the vacuum tube? The signal that came directly from the microphone was barely perceptible. There wasn't anything useful you could do with it unless you amplified its strength. But thanks to the triode vacuum tube brought to us by radio, we can take this weak signal and make it stronger. Then we can run the signal to a loudspeaker and voila, problem solved. Except, wait a minute, we, we skipped the record. So we've got a strong electrical signal that matches the sound being captured by the microphone. How can we turn that into a wobbly groove in a disc, suitable for playing with my Victrola? With magnets, of course. With our knowledge of how to make something move using electromagnets, we set out to make a slightly different sort of loudspeaker. Rather than use electromagnetism to vibrate a diaphragm, we used it to vibrate a needle. There's nothing about the construction of this loudspeaker that says we have to attach the coil of wire to a diaphragm. We could just get rid of all that stuff and attach the center part that moves to a needle. Okay, we'd have to shrink it a lot and we'd probably need to use a lever or something, but it could be done. And that's exactly what we did. A new invention, which today we call a phonograph cartridge, made possible electrical recording of discs. Using the technology from radio, we took the weak signal coming from microphones, amplified it as if we were going to drive a loudspeaker, but rather than send it to a loudspeaker, we sent it to a phonograph equipped with an electric cartridge. Now the electrical signal coming from the microphone and boosted by the vacuum tube caused the needle in the cartridge to vibrate back and forth. So what's the big deal then? It seems like it's rather a roundabout way to record music on a disc when you could just do it directly with an acoustic reproducer. Ah, but remember the problems the heavy diaphragm caused for discs. Only some part of the sound would make it onto the record, and it meant that records sounded artificial and tinny. The electric cartridge can cut the grooves in a record much more precisely, and because we are using the same sensitive microphones we use in radio, the groove is cut with all of the sound capable of being picked up by the microphone. So now we have discs that contain the same quality of sound as radio. A big deal. Ah, but there's still a problem. The phonographs of the day were still using the primitive acoustic reproducers. So while the discs contained far more detail in their grooves than ever before, the phonographs we played them with couldn't capture any of that detail. The Victor company solved that problem, though, with what they called the orthophonic Victrola. These new Victrolas had a special reproducer that was more delicate but could move easily, meaning that even the highly detailed sounds in the groove could be reproduced. And they used a special horn that amplified the sound both in greater quantity and with greater accuracy. Plus, there's one more thing. Remember that sound is a world of opposites. I showed you how headphones actually function as crude microphones because electromagnets either move as a response to current or they create current in response to motion. So it stands to reason that if I take a record and play it with one of these new electric phonograph cartridges, the vibrating needle would cause the coil of wire in the cartridge to vibrate and that would create a signal. Well, I can tell you it for sure does. Why is this important? There are a ton of reasons, but we'll keep it to two for the purposes of this video. The first and most important reason was that by using an electric cartridge to play records rather than record them, you'd get an electrical signal from the surface of the record. You could then send this signal through a triode vacuum tube and play the disc back with a loudspeaker. With this in mind, companies started producing radios with a new type of phonograph built in. These new phonographs used a tone arm fitted with an electric cartridge rather than a reproducer. Simply flick a switch and the amplifier in the radio will now amplify the signal coming from the record player and not the antenna. These radio phonograph combos were a huge hit. They were made to look like furniture, following in the footsteps of the Victrola and were often called radiolas. The second advantage wasn't obvious at first, but eventually led to new developments. As you may remember, the absurdly heavy reproducers and acoustic phonographs would wear out discs as you played them. We got around this by using replaceable needles and putting an abrasive compound into the discs so that they ground down the needle's point as you played it. These new cartridges weighed only a small fraction of the reproducer's weight. Eventually, we realized that we didn't need replaceable needles. Instead, we used a stylus with a sapphire or diamond tip that didn't need replacing for months or years. Plus, the fact that we were using lighter cartridges meant that we could improve the disc itself. The abrasive compound used in the discs created a lot of noise, but now we could remove the compound because we didn't need to worry about a heavy reproducer destroying the disc. 
This alone led to better sound, but further improvements were also made. We'll talk about those in a later episode. Every phonograph made in the last 80 years or so uses an electric cartridge. This modern turntable has the same thing. A diamond stylus sits in the groove of the record, and the vibration caused by the walls in the groove is transferred inside the cartridge where an electromagnet, just like in a microphone or loudspeaker, creates a small current that can be amplified and used to drive a loudspeaker. So here's something that I alluded to, but might not seem obvious at first. The microphone, loudspeaker, and phonograph cartridge are all the same thing. The only difference is lie in A, are we moving something with a current or are we creating a current through motion, and B, what exactly are we moving? Microphones are delicate and use light materials so that their diaphragms move in response to all sounds, loud or soft, high or low. Loudspeakers are built robustly so that they can move a lot of air and thus make a lot of noise. Functionally, they are opposites, but they work using the same principle, electromagnetism. Likewise, the phonograph cartridge also works both ways. If we send current to it, the needle will vibrate so we can cut new records using a cutting needle. But when we play it back with a standard needle, the vibrations caused by the disc itself create a current in the cartridge. The phonograph cartridge is nothing more than a microphone, but instead of using a diaphragm to capture vibrations from the air, it uses a needle to capture vibrations laid in a disc. It's this sort of ingenuity that leads to innovations in all fields. How can we take a principle we already know and apply it in a radically different way? Which is a wonderful segue into next week's episode. Thank you for joining me on Technology Connections. The next breakthrough for sound took electromagnetism to a whole new level. In next week's episode, we'll be exploring magnetic recording.